welcome to participants uh, who are uh, uh, watching this presentation. Um, uh, my apologies in advance if it's not quite as polished as the two earlier platform knowledge pieces. That's number one on policy coherence with uh, my colleague Steve Wiggins and platform knowledge piece two on aid to uh, uh, agriculture with uh, Lydia Cabral, my colleague. Uh, those are both on, on the website. Uh, as Monica was saying, those were beautiful presentations and uh, uh, they were reflecting projects which had really been completed substantially. Uh, this is going to be less polished um, because we submitted a draft report a week ago, um, but it has a real benefit that uh, there's now two weeks before we start finalising the documentation so we really can respond to the, the comments that you make to me at this presentation and, and subsequently. So our uh, ears are certainly open for, for your comments. Just moving quickly on, um, the structure of the presentation very much follows the structure of the, the report that's been circulated. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, policy uh, private sector response to that policy change and how donors uh, have supported private sector development. Um, I'll then just touch on some emerging conclusions and, and recommendations. So if we just start at the beginning, I've got two introductory slides. Uh, really just bringing everyone up to speed of where, where, what, why we're doing what we're doing and, and where we are in the process. Um, the aims of this platform knowledge piece uh, are really simple. It's to understand the role of the private sector in rural areas and to help donors engage uh, more effectively. Um, now this is obviously a huge question. So. What we did to try and make it more manageable was to turn it into bite-sized chunks. And you'll see the four research questions. Uh, in, in brief, we looked at uh, policy change over the last 30 years or so and how that's impacted on the private sector activity in rural areas. Uh, we've looked at the private sector response, uh, how donors have tried to stimulate private sector development and the implications, which I imagine would be the, the key part for a lot of the, uh, uh, the members looking, looking at this presentation, the implications of these findings. So, our final introductory slide is really just to give you a flavour of what we've done, what the empirical basis of, of the comments that I'm making uh, this morning are. I think the, the really rich empirical evidence for our work is based on five country case studies. Uh, as you'll see, two in, two in Africa, uh, one in Latin America, and two in Southeast Asia. Very different uh, types of country, very different policy environments. Uh, extremely interesting comparative exercise uh, looking, looking at the data from those studies. Now, these studies are really rather detailed, extremely rich evidence, and they will be published and available to everyone on the website in the form of a working paper. And uh, thanks to colleagues that have already started commenting on, on those documents. So a lot of the data comes from those five country case studies. Um, in addition, we did what we call cross-cutting um, uh, work uh, John Howell uh, worked on public policy. Um, uh, my colleague uh, Albert Alema worked on a global survey of private sector activity in rural areas. And Karen, uh, Karen Ellis um, uh, worked on the donor survey. So that, that um, information is all substantially complete now. And the only thing remaining is the most difficult bit, which is actually pulling all of this together. Um, we've obviously had synthesis workshops within the uh, Overseas Development Institute team. Uh, we've also, uh, two weeks ago, presented our emerging findings uh, in, in Rome at uh, IFAD, and a number of the membership joined uh, that presentation. 
Uh, and as I said earlier, a week ago we produced the first draft report, um, which we'll be uh, finalising over the next couple of weeks. So that's enough of the introduction. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, the sorry, could I just take that? Uh, I'll, I'll just turn the phone off. There we go. Um, so we're looking now at the policies. We've summarised the uh, policies, uh, which are um, the um, which have driven the uh, the private sector activity in rural areas since since 1980. Um, there has obviously been a general rolling back of the state um, in in. Uh, in terms of market deregulation and trade liberalisation over the last 30 years. Um, but our, our surveys have found that government involvement is still very significant in many staple markets and export markets. And this is not just uh, a, an African issue. Um, it's astonishing, for instance, to find that the, in Thailand, the Prime Minister actually chairs uh, the committee which determines the price of rice, domestic price of rice within, within Thailand. So very heavy government involvement at, at uh, staples and, and many exports. Uh, in our study, we don't take an ideological position on this, and we have noted examples where state intervention uh, has actually been progressive. And for instance, the, the examples where uh, the uh, involvement of the Ghanaian state in pineapple production uh, in encouraging producers to develop their new new varieties which were required by particularly the European market uh, has been highlighted. Um, now the most important aspects of deregulation in terms of private sector response um, have been the policy changes in terms of external trade, uh, the macroeconomic management and, and state support for growth. Um, but if we, we look at agriculture, it's often not benefited much from general private sector um, support, for instance, through foreign direct investment, um, where actually now the evidence from Asia and Latin America um, is that uh, really highlights the importance of the public investment in hard and, and soft infrastructure, which very often the private sector will not provide uh, if the state retreats. Um, so the point is that the private sector agenda should not be reduced, in, in our view, to just looking at small, quick uh, market development interventions. Moving swiftly on to the uh, four slides on the private sector response. Um, I think in terms of the global survey, one, one of the striking features was the dynamic growth in, in the uh, agri agricultural activity in, in many rural areas. Uh, I include on this slide just a, an example, which is uh, coffee in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, where uh, output went from very low level to uh, the uh, Vietnam being the second largest producer of coffee in the world uh, in, in a matter of uh, 10 years. Not only did output increase very fast, but also uh, you'll see from the graph productivity um, has increased dramatically and, and yields have, have doubled over the, over the last decade. Now, moving on to the question of who is investing in rural areas. Um, an extremely difficult statistical question we found. Um, we got quite a lot of information about small parts of the picture. And um, in terms of this, this middle line here, let me see if I can uh, point, point with the arrow. Um, the uh, the investment of foreigners, both in terms of foreign direct investment um, uh, and also uh, overseas uh, development assistance, 
Um, we know really rather accurately what that is, and we know that it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the agricultural value added for, for developing countries. Uh, in terms of the much more significant flows of uh, investment into the agricultural sector, we know a bit about uh, domestic public sector investment, uh, which is from IFPRI. Uh, we know that about a third of the uh, agricultural value added is, is from the public sector in developing countries. And we know very little about the other two thirds, which is the blue bit here, which is the domestic private sector. This is clearly, uh, this is the residual category. No one's measuring domestic private sector investment. Um, it's uh, just the gap that when you take an account of all the other sources um, of investment, what's left. So we know that two thirds uh, of the what's driving ag uh, agricultural transformation in rural areas um, is not something that is something that we're not measuring. Uh, which is domestic private sector investment. Moving swiftly on, um, and this is really this slide is very much informed from the value chain, the the studies which we did at the country level, which were based on on value chains rather than the the global uh, picture. And um, we found the two actually complement each other very nicely, and the the more local uh, country reports were able to provide quite a lot of detail as to why the things that uh, were happening at a global level, explaining why those trends were taking place. Um, again, the dynamism of agricultural uh, value chains is very clear, and um, it's certainly clear that in in Asia and Latin America, a lot of labour is being released into the uh, non-farm economy, and more generally, the role of uh, uh, an agricultural sector that's gaining in productivity, how that supports uh, broader transformative growth <coughs> excuse me, within the, the economy is very clear, releasing people to move into higher productive uh, jobs in, in rural and, and urban sectors. Policy matters. Um, clearly, good policy can leverage a huge private sector investment. And what destroys this investment is actually uncertainty. Um, and it's very clear when you look at the, the staples market in, in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. And some examples in the export sector as well, how policy uncertainty really destroys investment and, and performance in rural areas. Um, Value chains are getting shorter in two different ways. One, one is geographically, um, due to urbanisation and rapid economic development in, in much of the South, uh, there is now a domestic urban market which is um, growing very fast and often is more attractive from the point of view of producers than the traditional export market, um, which uh, is developmentally extremely important because it means that uh, producers can be linked into viable chains which often do not have the barriers that uh, export markets do. So geographically, chains are getting shorter, but also functionally, extremely interesting squeezing of the wholesale node between the retailers and, and typically large supermarkets, which have an extremely important role in uh, uh, a number of the countries where, where we do our, our country studies. Re the wholesale sector getting squeezed between a strengthening retail mode and, and the producers. And for instance, the, uh, if you look at the, the four largest uh, uh, supermarkets in, in Thailand, they're, they're foreign owned and extremely actively developing their own supply chain. There's also vertical integration uh, within value chains. And for instance, in, in Thailand, the whole chicken industry is based on the model of contract, contract farming, where buyers have long-term relationships with their suppliers. And as a result of that, 
will support those clients with inputs uh, and advice. Uh, developmentally, extremely important. And very surprised to find that even in, in the staple sector, in some places, for instance, in Peru, in the, the Rice Valley chain, that uh, the uh, buyers are developing forward contracts for rice farmers, which is uh, extremely unusual in, in the staple sector. Really just reflects the demand and the scarcity of uh, staple food supply. Um, Value chains are getting much better informed. Um, I was a bit cynical about the impact of uh, mobile phones on, on development, but there, uh, there's very clear evidence that not only uh, mobile phone ownership is, is increasing very fast and, and it's across a 50% barrier in sub Saharan Africa, but that this is having an impact on markets. And in the report, we talk about how some of the price differentials between different markets within uh, the domestic economy, how they've been impacted by uh, mobile telephones. And I think the, uh, the final point I'd like to make here is that we really do see now quite a lot of evidence that there's a fundamental, a profound change in the balance between supply and demand, uh, between producers and consumers. Uh, Obviously, most most clearly de demonstrated during the uh, 2008 price hike, but actually subsequent to that, um, that producers um, are getting a, a much better deal, and the market is is uh, is looking for their their output from smallholders. And again, some really interesting work by Michigan State um, in Kenya, Malawi, and Zambia. Uh, demonstrating the lengths which traders are now going to some of the, the most remote villages uh, to, to try and secure their supply chains. Uh, and in, I guess finally, why, why, why does any of this matter? Well, it, I think it matters to us from a, a development perspective um, because agricultural growth is very pro poor um, and there's there's good empirical evidence to show that. Uh, and specifically, it's pro-poor in the sense of targeting the, the poorest, the below dollar a day um, uh, uh, household income level. Once you get above that level, other non-agricultural sectors um, uh, come into play. But below that level, it's, it is agriculture which can target those, those households. So moving on, uh, the rationale for working with the private sector, which is, uh, I guess, implicit to, uh, to our work. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can I, can I just pull the phone out of the socket? And let's get the slide up here. Great, so the, the point is here that uh, what we're developing is uh, an implicit rationale for donors working in the private sector. What's clear from our work is that what's transforming rural areas um, is private sector development. So donors need to understand uh, what, if, they, if donors want to understand the context in which they're working, they need to understand the private sector. There's also significant evidence that uh, private sector, in order for the private sector to take off, there's a need for significant public investment. And although overseas uh, ODA is tiny globally, it can help uh, specific countries develop the conditions for growth. And then finally, the most basic uh, rationale, I think, for engaging with the private sector is that uh, uh, overseas development assistance is small and temporary, uh, whereas the private sector is, is large and permanent. And so for, for overseas development to have impact in, in the productive sectors in rural areas, really needs the private sector to have impact and sustainability. So moving on to the next slide, which is about donor approaches. I'm trying to summarize 30 years of 
donor experience in one slide. So it's it's a bit crowded, and I fully accept that the the progression from the macro level interventions to improve the investment climate through to gap filling, uh, filling of gaps left by the market, to the market development approaches and uh, dialogue with the private sector. I fully accept that some of the interventions I'm going to talk about are um, not exclusive to one of those categories. Um, and also that uh, it's not a linear, it's not a linear process because clearly there are elements of some of the early, early work um, which should be, well, are and should be carried through into, into the present and future. But with those, this is just a simplification to try and summarize a lot of information very quickly. So let's look at each, each of these categories. On the um, macro level interventions, um, this really captures the structural adjustment in the 80s and 90s with the a fairly standard package of uh, privatization, liberalization, deregulation. Um, uh, it also captures the uh, investment, investment uh, uh, in infrastructure and uh, access to uh, financial services. This, this is in terms very often from the donor context, uh, microfinance, co-ops and, uh, and uh, agriculture and rural banks. Uh, rarely particularly effective uh, and often subject to political capture um, and, and um, uh, a lack of sustainability. But just trying to conclude from, from this, this first uh, section of work, uh, I think that what we're learning is that creating an enabling environment is important, but liberalisation by itself is not enough. Uh, and the supply side constraints um, must be tackled if producers are going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities uh, uh, created by market liberalization. Turning to this second uh, collection of activities under the uh, gap filling title, um, market liberalization under the Washington consensus did result in the rollback of the state. Um, and very often, as, as we've already mentioned, <coughs> markets failed to develop as expected. And donors have often walked into that space uh, to fund or, or subsidize activities that were uh, under provided by the market. And I've given a couple of examples here where often very high uh, returns actually to research investment, um, but I think clear evidence it will be substantially underprovided uh, by the private sector. Uh, similarly with the extension services where the dissemination of good agronomic uh, practice to, to rural communities um, is very much public good, there are spillover effects and so there's a strong rationale for public investment uh, in this, this area. Um, and some very interesting uh, work looking at the private provision of, uh, of extension services has been, has been done recently. Uh, in terms of input subsidies, quite a contentious area here. And um, clearly modern seeds and fertilizer can significantly increase agricultural uh, productivity. Um, but the market remains weak. So donors have um, quite often supported input provision and um, often uh, channeled subsidies through, through government. Um, there are successes, and um, Malaw is the, the frequently cited example, where the direct uh, subsidy of uh, fertilizer has resulted in significant increase. Uh, in output by smallholders. Um, there are other examples where this has proved to be quite costly and, and difficult to target and can undermine the uh, private input market. I think generally though the, we do need to make the point that the, the rationale, the economic rationale for subsidies is less strong for input subsidies where the benefits are a private good rather than uh, as compared with research and extension services. <coughs> 
And similarly with business development services, this is a bit of a catch-all covering a whole covering a whole range of training, consultancy, information technology. And the donor uh, committee for enterprise development has has uh, reviewed the provision of BDS and found very often that direct support is rather ineffective. There are fairly few benefits um, uh, generated by that, and that the interventions are often not sustainable. And the general recommendation that agencies should facilitate markets for BDS, uh, not subsidising uh, the direct delivery um, of, of services themselves. Turning to the market uh, development approaches, uh, um, Markets for the Poor, or M4P, uh, has emerged uh, as an important approach over the last decade. It's a response uh, to what many agencies saw uh, as the failure of the traditional subsidy uh, for um, uh, enterprise, and uh, really a need for uh, greater impact and sustainability. The charge that the M4P approach makes on, on traditional approaches is that um, uh, donors often didn't understand market systems and as a result created inappropriate interventions uh, which actually distorted uh, indigenous market mechanisms. Um, our feeling is that the central rationale uh, of M4P is really based on a failure in the past, which I think is, is um, absolutely credible. Um, what we've highlighted in the report is actually the, there are some examples of the success um, of implementing a, a market development approach. But uh, at the moment, there's a rather thin um, uh, empirical basis for that. Uh, the kind of interventions which uh, are, are supported by uh, the MPP approaches uh, include the support to producer organisations, um, often with a, within a value chain um, framework. So MPP, in, in our view, has, has had some uh, successes and has certainly helped donors to understand um, how to approach market-led development, but the uh, the conceptual elegance of the approach has not been matched, uh, in our view, by robust empirical evidence of, of development impacts to date. And then finally, the uh, dialogue and partnership with the private sector. Uh, this can take several forms, and um, the uh, one of which that we talk about in the report is the uh, development of growth corridors, and we use the, the example in, in Tanzania, where the government and international private sector appear to be collaborating rather successfully to develop clusters of profitable agribusiness um, in, in a very poor rural area. Um, in terms of the policy engagement, uh, extremely interesting work here that we've, we've reviewed, looking, for instance, at the uh, new agricultural fund for um, uh, Africa, which is very much a private sector-led approach to uh, agricultural development. Um, and then the uh, sustainability initiatives by a number of corporate uh, entities. Um, for instance, the uh, Cabris Cocoa Partnership in, in West Africa, which is involves the support to cocoa farming communities to improve their security of supply. Uh, and it's a mix of core business, corporate social responsibility and marketing, but I think the former uh, becoming increasingly important as corporates become more concerned about accessing the physical access to their, their supply chain. And these, we feel, uh, create some really exciting prospects for, for donors. Turning very quickly to uh, an evolving agenda, clearly. I mean, we, from our work, there's a rich diversity 
in terms of what donors are doing. And uh, it's, uh, it's partly a split between the more traditional approach to rural development uh, and more at the centre of our, our dartboard here, and then more innovative approaches around the edges. Um, but also, even within the more innovative approaches, um, we have clear differences. We have <coughs> GIZ, which is, is working with uh, individual companies, providing uh, financial, but increasingly technical support to, to large corporates. It has the market transformation attempts of uh, IDH, which is the Dutch Sustainable Trade Initiative, uh, which is working on a subsector level to transform uh, whole subsectors uh, from the market end and follow uh, that back into the, uh, the source markets. Um, DFID is, is clearly very strongly linked to challenge funds. The um, African Enterprise Challenge Fund is a, a very obvious example, co-funded with a number of other donors. And then um, uh, Swiss Development Corporation, which we, we think has really taken the uh, market development philosophy uh, and integra integrated it most closely into its actual development program. So the point here really at this slide is just to say that donors, donors are doing lots of different things and there are, there's a lot of innovation out there with donors um, uh, exploring different approaches to working with the private sector. <coughs> um, now in terms of our, our conclusions from this donor work, um, it seems that there's been a pretty mixed uh, impact uh, in terms of donors working with the private sector uh, in the past. And this, this uh, mixed history certainly has not made it easy to motivate uh, for increased funding for private sector development activities. Um, there are several different market-based approaches uh, that, that uh, are being tried. They look promising, but they do have a very weak uh, evidence base in terms of their, their effectiveness. And, uh, as you'll, you'll recall from the, the previous slide, the dartboard, donors are in very different places in terms of their philosophy, um, but also their practical capacity to engage with the private sector. Now, we don't buy the line that rural areas um, uh, will become dynamic cauldrons of private sector growth just with a few short-term blockages removed. Uh, the experience, we believe, shows that there's a need for quite a lot of heavy lifting in terms of uh, infrastructure provision um, to get the environment right, uh, to then uh, have a situation where entrepreneurs can respond to short-term market and development initiatives. But the rationale for working with the private sector, we believe, is strong. And ignoring it will not contribute to good development. Um, and uh, working with the private sector um, will in, uh, enhance both the impact and sustainability of aid. So if I can turn finally just to our uh, emerging recommendations. Um, it's not, uh, uh, it's not easy or, or clear cut, but we believe that the case for donors working uh, more closely with the private sector is very strong. Um, we shouldn't, as donors, obsess about uh, farmers and departments of agriculture alone. Very often the barriers to uh, agricultural and rural development uh, are found elsewhere in the value chain. It's not just about short-term market interventions. Very often, the expensive long-term provision of infrastructure is important also. And engaging with the private sector does imply very big changes in the way we do aid. And we're talking about working with people with very different backgrounds, we're talking about different uh, instruments, different different approaches to delivering aid. So the change uh, of uh, 
required from working more, more closely with private sector is actually rather, rather significant. And in terms of the global donor platform itself, um, this is new territory uh, for many donors. And it is really important, and we think the, the, the platform can, has got an important role here to share credible and honest information about what is and is not working. Um, we feel very strongly that the platform should partner uh, with complementary initiatives. So we, we mentioned here the uh, DCED, uh, particularly in terms of impact assessment and, and market development approaches. Um, but also CADAP in terms of a strong focus on private sector development and infrastructure delivery. And the, the big issue really for, for us is how to make changes to allow for a more effective engagement uh, between donors and the private sector. And we think that um, some of these softer inst institutional innovations, uh, the platform is in an extremely good position to support those. So I've come to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I've tried to summarize a huge amount of information uh, in a very short time. Um, so very, very welcome to uh, listen to any comments or, or questions that you have from that. Thank you. Well, I've got a question. If um, if I can start, is that, is that okay? Sure. Um, so my name's Ian Randall, and I work closely with Augustan actually, who's on the in the meeting as well, um, and supporting Cat uh, on behalf of development partners. And we're both currently involved with an initiative uh, with the World Economic Forum and the African Union who are looking to support um, essentially a sort of rollout of the kind of initiative that we've seen um, at SAGCOP, the Tanzanian yeah. um, example, in which there are the dialogue between kind of countries around developing an initiative in country and also attracting the international private sector um, as partners in supporting that. Yeah. Um, and we're actually coming up to a meeting in November where there'll be seven countries, including Tanzania and Mozambique, um, who are sort of meeting with the private sector to explore options. Now, with that, I was struck by one of your earlier slides that had um, the influence of foreign direct investment was a tiny sliver across the top um, compared to domestic. And I was curious to hear from you whether that was because foreign direct investment is mostly irrelevant and therefore it's the wrong place to be looking, or whether it's because it's hugely untapped. And absolutely it's the right place to be looking. So, well, what a great question. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, this, this diagram I think is, is striking. And just a couple of health warnings that, that should go with it. Um, this is, you might not have seen a diagram like this before for very good reasons. Uh, we've been working quite closely with the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization to kind of piece together. Uh, some very prickly statistics. So the first health warning is these figures could could be um, could be wrong quite significantly. Even, even if they were, though, it wouldn't change the the general picture. Um, the second caveat is that uh, we limited the FDI here to on farms foreign direct investment and. You know, I, I'm very struck, and we're we're still awaiting the figures to look at FDI in other parts of the agricultural value chain, like processing, like input supplies. Where, particularly in Tanzania, that's where probably the bulk of that would be reflected. And so, I think uh, uh, if we look at an expanded definition of agriculture to include those. I think that we'd get a much bigger, bigger chunk coming from foreign direct investment. Uh, 
And I guess the third point to make is this is looking over the whole world for the last 30 years. Uh, it doesn't mean that when you look at one corner of one particular country at one time, foreign direct investment might not be extremely important. And I, and I think Tanzania is a great example, actually, of, of just that. Right. So we should, we're still on the right track. We shouldn't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, I think so. And the, the, um, I think the, what this, this diagram to me um, is actually a, an extremely strong and positive message that the bulk of the bulk of support is is actually from uh, the domestic sector, both public and, and private, and that um, as as governments, you've got to keep uh, our, our indigenous private sector uh, working, functioning, and, and developing. And if we don't, that uh, there's a limited capacity for uh, international actors to come and bail us out, whether it's it's donors or or um, uh, inter international capital. Thank All right, thank you, Ian, for your question. Um, Augustin would like to ask something now. Yes, thanks, Helena. Uh, thanks, John, for your presentation. As you are aware, we have been in contact uh, on this uh, work of yours for a while now. After your, following your presentation, I would like to raise a few issues here. Mm. Uh, maybe for, for us to be able to kind of uh, uh, highlight uh, key points that may not be uh, well reflected in the report. In one of the recommendations, you uh, say something about uh, facilitating market instead of uh, supporting subsidies uh, programs. I wonder whether you are aware of uh, the subsidies uh, debate triggered in, um, uh, with regard to the to the decisions by the government of Malawi and mm -hmm. in a few countries. Uh, to what extent are you capturing this in the report? To, uh, mm -hmm. to what extent are you using the lessons <laughs> learned to inform the, the current report of yours? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first issue I wanted to raise. Uh, I must be honest to say that the, the only part of your report I read uh, is the, the Ghana report and the Tanzania report. I haven't uh, uh, yet read the, the, the draft report that was included by Monica some, some time ago, but I read your PowerPoint and I now uh, listen to your presentation and I also have uh, one question, maybe it's already captured in your report, but uh, maybe I still uh, have to raise it here to make sure that uh, we don't uh, lose it. We are now talking about uh, uh, environmental, um, uh, about climate change and everything that has to be uh, climate smart and uh, so on and so forth. Um, as you look at the environmental issues uh, uh, in, the, in the, I mean, when it comes to private sector engagement in ARG with donors, have you uh, tried to figure out uh, whether the environmental aspect of uh, of uh, the support or the engagement is being given enough for consideration from both sides i mean donors and private sectors actors the third question i would like to ask uh, concerns the recommendations as well you said something about the, the enthusiasm within the donor community uh, for engagement with private sector I would very much like us to have a sense of whether there are a set, a set of determinants of, uh, uh, for enthusiasm, I mean to, uh, to kind of uh, analyze the enthusiasm. How do you mm -hmm. see whether a donor, a specific donor is quite enthusiastic when it mm -hmm. comes to engagement with the private sector? Yeah. Uh, I think for now, and I will stop there. I, I have two more comments, but I'm, I'm sure as we discuss uh, 
certainly you will address them or I will have to bring them out. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Augustine. Really, really searching questions there. Um, on, the, on the issue of subsidies and inputs, uh, I'm, I'm well aware that this is, um, this is a really, uh, it's an area of very active debate at the moment. And I, I talked about the uh, Malawi experience, uh, I think quite deliberately to show that what we're not doing in, in this report is uh, trying to take an ideological viewpoint. I mean, clearly taking a, a specific ideological market development approach. Um, everything about the Malawi uh, uh, fertilizer subsidy uh, I should tell you that it shouldn't uh, shouldn't be a good idea. Yet um, there's very clear empirical evidence that, uh, in many ways, it's been extremely successful. So what what we've done in in this report, because um, it is very ideologically contentious, the whole subject matter, uh, is to base our work very much on the empirical evidence. So. Uh, we will. We have mentioned uh, Malawi in the report. We will be strengthening that, and I think contrasting it, for instance, with some of the approaches in Kenya, where rather than directly providing subsidised inputs to farmers, there's been uh, a, a more of a, a development of input markets, and. Um, not making a judgment about which one is good and which one is bad, but just saying these are different different ways of uh, of approaching a very important problem and to highlight the weaknesses in both. So um, what I wouldn't like to come out of our report is a hardline market, you know, narrow market development approach is the only way to succeed because we have looked rather carefully at the evidence, and I don't think the evidence supports that. Um, we're trying to develop a more nuanced uh, story about different approaches working in, in different situations, and that actually it's not helpful to, to have a strict adherence to any one conceptual framework. Um, if I can move on to your second question. the. Um, uh, in short, no, we, I don't think we have looked um, uh, significantly at all at uh, environmental aspects. Um, to be honest, the, the scope of the, the study was so broad um, that we found it quite difficult to, to um, turn it into something in manageable from a, from a research viewpoint. Um, I, I agree that it's an extremely valid question on uh, the environmental aspects of rural development policy. And I think there's uh, it's very important both in terms of finance going into the sector and policy development, but we haven't dealt with it in, in this project. And um, we saw it as being outside the scope of the project. Um, obviously, I'm happy to, to discuss that further if, if you wish. Now, your third point about the determinants of enthusiasm uh, for working in the private sector, uh, really interesting one there. And clearly, there's the, uh, there's the issue uh, for many of the uh, members of the, the donor platform uh, about political change in, in Europe and the, the emergence of a, a new generation of white wing governments that are more predisposed to working in the private sector. So clearly it's partly that. Uh, I think it's partly actually something that's been happening within the development sector for quite a while, where people have been thinking that just for, for uh, in terms of development impact and the sustainability of that impact, that it's, it's important that donors work with the private sector. Um, I think also there is um, an indigenous uh, interest, um, and, and that's really why I've, I've really enjoyed our linking you, your process and our process having a, having a, an interaction. Because uh, looking at some of the documentation, for instance, coming out of, of the CADAP process, 
it, it seems clear to me that there's a level of enthusiasm. I don't think it's, it's you know, universal, or, or and, and it's certainly the case in Europe either, but there's a level of interest in working with the private sector from Africa's viewpoint also. So I think there are, there are several different determinants uh, of, of this enthusiasm, um, which is why different agencies are at very different places at, at the moment, depending on the interaction of those, those different determinants. Thanks, uh, John, for this uh, very good, short, succinct uh, presentation. Thanks, uh, Ian and uh, Augustine, for the questions. I understand, Augustine, you have more questions, so let's keep connected with John and discuss them um, uh, some more. I, um, I found some of the uh, findings, you've whittled them down to, to really clear statements now. I've, I found that interesting. And um, I, I think we might even tease this presentation, which will go on the web after we've cut out the few telephone rings, um, with, with some of those quotes, like liberalization by itself is not enough, Direct support is often rather ineffective. Exciting prospects for donors uh, are in uh, the new PSD approaches. Uh, I hope that we'll tease and get some reaction, and I very much hope that we will um, have that discussion even next year beyond Busan, as I said in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.